intersects with tonight's debate? Uh, because you've been quite vocal on the topic mm -hmm. of political correctness. Yes, well, I'm no fan of the radical left. And, it, you know, and people might say, well, does that mean you support the radical right? And it's like, just because you're no fan of the radical left doesn't mean you support the radical right. That's an absolutely a preposterous proposition. But the universities, especially the humanities and social sciences, are absolutely dominated by left-wing thinking. That's well documented by people by, like Jonathan Haidt. It's not my imagination. And I find the doctrine that unites them to be unconscionably pernicious. It's basically a collectivist doctrine. And the thing that disturbs me about it, like, there's every reason to have a left wing. The reason you need a left wing is partly because being left wing is in part temperamental. It's not going away. And also because when our society produces hierarchies, which it will inevitably do, people tend to stack up at the bottom of hierarchies. It's in the nature of hierarchies to produce that as an outcome. And what that means is that the people who are dispossessed in the hierarchical arrangements need a voice, and that's the left, mm -hmm. obviously, and, and fair enough. But it's ob also obvious that just as the right can go too far, the left can go too far. But when the left goes too far is something that's very ill-defined. And to me, that's, that's not acceptable, given that we know that the left can go too far. And I think they've certainly gone too far in the universities. And the postmodern neo-Marxist pastiche that makes up the radical left philosophy that's at the bottom of the social sciences and humanities now is there's nothing about it that's useful, as far as I'm concerned. That has nothing to do with compassion. It has nothing to do with lack of, my lack of, what would you say? Empathy? Yeah, precisely. They're completely separate issues. And that's another thing that really bothers me about political correctness. It's like, well, we have a hammerlock on empathy. It's like, A, empathy is not enough. It's not mm. even close to enough. And an excess of empathy can do terrible things. And B, no, you don't have a hammerlock on empathy. And to ally that with a philosophy that essentially assigns people to their identity via their group membership, mm. and then to read not only the current state of affairs, but history itself as a battleground between competing groups is, mm. I think it's dangerous. Mm. I think it's obvious that it's dangerous if you know anything about mm. history. But one argument you're sure to hear tonight is this idea of privilege that certain yeah. people, by virtue of you and I, by virtue of our, our race, our class, our gender, have enjoyed, historically, privilege in society. And it's time that that privilege be shared more equitably across groups who have been historically disadvantaged. Well, that's a good example of the conflation of empathy with ideology. It's like, first of all, the majority in any society has privilege. That's the whole point of the society, is to set up a system so that the bulk of the people in the system can do well. Well, and then you, ha you build in protection for minorities. So to conflate that with race is not acceptable. It's a kind of, it's a toxic sleight of hand, and it's extraordinarily dangerous. So apart from that, it's an empty claim. Some people have advantages that other people don't. Well, obviously. And if you take apart anyone into the multitude of categories that they can be taken apart into, what you'll find is that on some of those dimensions, they're doing better than other people <clears throat> for rather arbitrary reasons sometimes, mm -hmm. and on other dimensions, they're doing worse. So it purpo and then the next part of that is, well, historically speaking, it's mm -hmm. like, okay, over what span of time do you mean precisely? So you mean because my ancestors 150 years ago were privileged, comparatively speaking, that I should somehow pay for that now? Mm. And are you so sure my ancestors were so privileged? As far as I can tell, my grandparents on my father's side, my father grew up in a log cabin till he was five. It had like three rooms. My grandmother was a cleaning woman for, for farms in, the, in, this, in central Saskatchewan in the 1930s. Mm. She cooked for threshing crews, you know? She chopped wood piles that were as big as the damn cabin to get through the winter. It's like, where, where's the privilege? I see it accrues to me as a consequence of my race. Oh, I see. So we're now we're going to have a discussion about race, are we? Mm. 
That's, and that's the thing about the toxic left, is that everything is about group identity. And so let's say, let's even take the argument further though and say, okay, well, because of my skin color, I'm differentially privileged. Okay, so from, from a historical perspective. So, so what, you're going to make everybody, on the basis of the race now, pay for some historical inequity? Mm -hmm. And you're going to view the, the history of the relationships between men and women as one fundamentally of oppression. That's the way we're going to play this, is that it wasn't that men and women fundamentally cooperated throughout history to bring themselves out of the fundamental catastrophe that history has always been. That isn't what it was, despite the fact that in 1895, the typical person in the Western world lived on less than a dollar a day by today's standards, which is far below the UN's current guidelines for abject poverty. Mm. We're going to revisit that and we're going to say, no, really the fundamental reality of the world was that men oppressed women. It's like, yeah. So that brings me uh, to a second argument that you're no doubt going to hear tonight, which is that you know, men sh need to check their privilege, that there's an oh. idea here that uh, you know, women in particular, the Me Too movement, uh, there's been a, an awareness, an awakening, uh, the part of the power of women in society, and it's time that that be acknowledged. What, what will be your response to that? Well, first of all, when the discussion is about power, you know, that sends a shudder up my spine immediately, partly because part of the postmodern doctrine, especially in its alliance with neo-Marxism, which is the world's strangest alliance by, by my estimates, everything's about power, and I don't believe that. I think that Hierarchies are only about power when they've already transformed themselves into tyrannies. And I don't think that the fundamental hierarchies that characterize the West are tyrannical, comparatively speaking. Like, compared to the heavenly hierarchy in your utopian imagination, no doubt they're exemplars of pure hell, but compared to everywhere else in the world right now and every other hierarchy throughout history, we're doing pretty damn well. And, and the fact is, is that once we had reliable birth control, which really only happened in the 1960s, women were welcomed most fundamentally, although also opposed, but most fundamentally welcomed into every position of authority and competence that could possibly be laid open to them, to the point where now they make up something like, it's damn near three quarters of humanities and social sciences students. They dominate the healthcare fields. So, how fast do you expect the transformation to take place? Well, the argument is, well, it would have never happened without political pressure. It's like, yeah, no, sorry. That made the playing field open. And it, it's transformed utterly in, in, what, 50 years? How fast do you think these things can happen? Good point. So, and, and I'm certainly not against equality of opportunity. You have to be a, you have to, I don't know, what has to be wrong with you to be against equality of opportunity? You know, even if you're selfish, if you're not absolutely out for destruction and you're only selfish, let's say, Anybody with any sense would go for equality of opportunity, at least because it gives you the possibility of exploiting the maximal number of qualified and talented people. Mm -hmm. So, and equality of outcome, well. We'll save that for the debate tonight. I'm yeah. sure it'll come up. Final question I'm asking all of you pre-debate. Where do you think this debate is going to go from here? Do you think we're, we're in a kind of cultural spasm? Or do you think there's something more fundamental happening in our culture? A new tribalism, a new set of antagonisms they're going to take much longer to work at? I think it'll depend on how well we each behave in the next 10 years because I think things could get way better everywhere really fast or we could degenerate back into our idiot 20th century tribalisms and I would say if I had to bet well you know I mean, it's what always, are you seeing you're out there you're in, in the public's uh, I I, I really, I would say that there's plenty of pressure in both directions. You know, I'm heartened by the fact that so many people have been taking the psychological material that I've been providing online to heart and doing what they can to put themselves together. 
I'm disheartened by the fact that everything now is transformed into a, virtually everything is transformed into a polarized political argument, and there seems to be no understanding of the fact that not everything is actually political. Mm. I actually don't think that, I don't think the discussion about political correctness is political. I think it's, I think it's both theological and philosophical, mm. but it's, it's always presented or often presented in politicized terms, not least because if you're influenced by the radical leftist collective, collectivist ideology, that is the only playing field. Mm -hmm. It's all hierarchies at each other's throats playing power games. Mm -hmm. it's, it, the free speech thing is really interesting because on the radical left end of things, this, there is no debate about free speech. You can't have a debate about free speech from that ideological position because there isn't any such thing. All there is is those who are maneuvering for power within their respective groups making claims that benefit from mm -hmm. them. That's the basic axiom of the interpretive system. So free speech, it isn't that, it isn't, the reason that free speech has become politicized is because if you adopt the collectivist viewpoint, it's a shibboleth. It's a fantasy. Mm -hmm. You might think you're speaking freely, but you're not. No. You're just speaking expressing your privilege. Speaking on behalf of my gender, my Absolutely. class, my, my race. Mm. And we had, one of the things that's funny about the postmodern insistence on identity, I think it's absolutely comical in a very, very dark way, is the emergence of intersectionality. Because the intersectional theorists actually identified the Achilles heel of the collectivist perspective. You know, because what they pointed out was, well, let's say we cover the standard groups. I don't know why these are the standard groups, but let's say sex ethnicity and race for the sake of argument. Well, what about how they interact? It's like, yeah, what about that? What about the fact that gender is infinitely differentiable, not least from the left-wing perspective? And what about the fact that there's endless numbers of ethnic variants? Mm -hmm. And what are you going to do? You're going to control for the interaction between all of those? And the answer is yes, that's what we'll try to do before we give up our ideology. But the, the fact of the matter is, is that the reason the West decided on a radical individualist perspective to begin with is because we figured out 2,000 years ago, at least at the origins of this type of thinking, that everyone is so unique that you can, frac you can fractionate their group identity right down to the level of the individual. Mm -hmm. Well, so, yeah, I don't know what's going to happen. I think the universities, for example, I think they've done themselves in. I don't think they can escape from, because I, I, I've yeah. watched large organizations crumble, and that can happen very often. Mm -hmm. And one serious error will do it. Yeah. And I think, I've tried to lay it out, I think the universities have made seven serious errors. You know, and, we're going to have to say those for the stage tonight, yeah. and then universities will absolutely be a topic of our discussion. Okay. But a real pleasure to get a taste uh, for your remarks, and I appreciate your passion and your uh, willingness to to step onto the stage and engage with other people's ideas in a spirit of free and open exchange. Yeah, well, hopefully it'll go well and it'll be an intelligent discussion and we'll get somewhere.